course, I want to thank Globsec and CP for hosting this event today and a very interesting topic and, of course, for inviting me to, to speak. Uh, the topic is extremely timely, I think. We are, we're witnessing um, a Europe-wide conversation on, uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and more broadly about political Islam, Islamism, separatism, non-violent Islam, Islamism. I think every country seems to adopt its own term. Uh, but the topic is indeed very, very fashionable these days. Um, just over the last few years, we've seen ebbs and flows in the debate on the Brotherhood and on Islamism. If we just limit our analysis to the last 10 years, uh, we saw the UK government conducting the Muslim Brotherhood review in 2014. Then a bit of lack of interest for the most part, with some notable exceptions for the last few years partially because the phenomenon was overshadowed by, by terrorism, by ISIS. But over the last couple of years, we really see that the debate on the Muslim Brotherhood and on Islamism, and I, I mean on non-violent Islamism, with all the, the flaws that the term carries, uh, has really become very mainstream in a lot of European countries. And I think particularly in continental Europe, there's two countries that are leading the debate, France and Austria, where we see governments that are uh, unquestionably very aggressive in their challenge against Islamism. But we see that in many other countries throughout Europe, there's a renewed debate about Islamism. And I think that debate is uh, more intense and more informed than in the past. It's not perfect at all, far from it. Uh, but I think there's, uh, there's, more nuanced, uh, uh, there's more nuance if we compare it to the debate we, we saw 10 or 15 years ago. Um, it's a debate that sees concerns coming from all aisles, from all sides of the political spectrum. I think what we are seeing in, uh, in Austria and France, but in, uh, in other European countries, is concerns that are being voiced by um, individuals that come from all sides of the political spectrum. It used to, what things were used to be almost exclusively the domain of, of the center right, if not the right and extreme right, are now being voiced also by the center left and the left. I mean, I find it always fascinating that in Germany, the debate uh, and the criticism of the Brotherhood seems to be led by the Green Party. Uh, so hardly a hardcore right wing uh, group. Hans, you're smiling. I think you understand uh, what I mean. Uh, and what I think it's very interesting and oftentimes I think uh, not fully understood by, by people in America, again, with a lot of exceptions, is that the debate is not about terrorism or at least it's not mostly about terrorism. It's about the social impact of the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups. It's the impact on social cohesion and integration. The main concerns of the Europeans are there. There is a terrorism component, of course. Uh, there are questions about what is the impact on violent radicalization of the activities of groups like the Brotherhood, whether they cre create what the French call the um, Islamist ecosystem that allows for further radicalization, uh, what the Brits used to call the mood music, uh, but the debate is mostly about social cohesion. Uh, now, I think what we're going to see over the next few months is something very interesting because, of course, governments are introducing measures. Uh, we've seen uh, bills that have been introduced in both France and Austria with very substantive and very aggressive measures introduced by both governments. Uh, of course, there will be parliamentary and public debates about those, and I think it will be interesting months ahead of us from this point of view. And I think from uh, a researcher's point of view, it is the duty of uh, organizations like yours and like mine to provide the research uh, to inform this debate as much as possible. So I applaud Globsec, CP, and the authors for putting together uh, what is an excellent report, which I had the opportunity to, uh, to read, and as I read also the previous installations and I'm, I'm i'm very jealous in a, in a way because i've i've never really it's uh, looking at eastern europe is something that i've always kind of wanted to do but you know uh, life uh, life life gets in the way uh, but it's really something very comprehensive and i've uh, and i think it's something that nobody has done uh, particularly in, uh, in english language and i think the ability to also to look at both um, countries that have, uh, if not a Muslim majority, a substantial Muslim population, like Albania, uh, like, North, like Macedonia, uh, like Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also looking at countries like Poland or the Czech Republic, which to some degree resemble Western Europe of the 1980s with very small Muslim communities and with the embryos of, of a brotherhood presence there. It's something very interesting. So uh, again, that's my endorsement to the, the report. But I want to leave, of course, to the the authors the opportunity to present uh, the report. What I want to do 
and particularly if my technological skills don't abandon me because I have slides for this, is to talk about what I know a bit better, which is uh, the Brotherhood in the West. Uh, and by that, I mean Western Europe. And I'm hoping that, can anybody see the, the slides? Heads up, perfect. Uh, and kind of what I want to do is provide sort of a general framework uh, uh, of what we mean by my, my Muslim Brotherhood uh, in the West, uh, sort of a bit of a history, a bit of terminology, which I think is very important, uh, look at the aims and look at how some governments are looking at it. Uh, and I think the terminology part is very important. It's not to be uh, the overly zealous academic that wants to split hair and talk about terminology, but there are very important policy and legal implications in being precise about the language when we're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, if I go to the Middle East and I want to, and I meet members of the Brotherhood, they're not going to deny they're members of the Brotherhood. It's very open. They have a business card. Uh, in the West, I'm hard pressed to find one person beyond Kamal al-Bawi who openly admits being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. So being able to identify what is the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, which operates in a completely different way from how it operates in, uh, in the Arab world, it's something very, very important. Now, the, the history is very complex, and of course it changes from country to country, but summing it up in 30 seconds, um, it starts in the 1950s and 60s when small uh, numbers of Brotherhood members or Brotherhood sympathizers traveled from the Arab world set up shop in, uh, in Europe, in North America, uh, for the most part, either escaping persecution in the home countries or to study uh, in, in Western universities and created a very small uh, initial Muslim organizations, not calling them Muslim Brotherhood, of course, uh, mostly student organizations among the very first Muslim organizations in the West. Now, over time, uh, these entities have grown. And what, what we see now is that uh, the structures, whether public or, uh, or non-public, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a second, that Brotherhood members, those Brotherhood pioneers created starting in the 50s and 60s have evolved significantly and replicating, of course, on a micro level, uh, the structure and the dynamics of the Arab world, they have created branches in all Western countries. So uh, as that, exactly like we can speak of an Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, a, a Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood, an Algerian Muslim Brotherhood, and so on and so forth, it's fair to talk about a German Muslim Brotherhood, a French Muslim Brotherhood, a, Mel a Belgian Muslim Brotherhood, and so on and so forth. What these entities in the West do, although on, uh, on a much, much smaller scale, is exactly replicating the structure of those in the East with the Usra, uh, at sort of the, the, the core unit uh, at the bottom level, a mini structure with the same pyramid structure that exists in the, in the, in the East. Now, if in, uh, in Muslim countries like Egypt, there's at least a million members of the Muslim Brotherhood, in large European countries like France or Germany, we're talking about maybe a thousand members of the Brotherhood. And in smaller countries like Denmark or the Netherlands, we're talking about maybe a hundred members. So obviously we're talking about significantly smaller numbers, but these individuals belong to what uh, I would call the secret or non-public uh, organization. So if you read books that explain how the Brotherhood works in Egypt, in Syria, replicate that in the West just on a smaller scale. Now, the difference between in the East and the West, and I think to, to a large degree you can apply that to, East, to the Eastern European context, is the fact that this core, let's call it non-public, uh, organization of the Brotherhood in each European country has created organizations that are public, that are sort of the, the facade, the face of, um, of the Brotherhood. They are the names that everybody knows from uh, uh, Islamische Gemeinschaft Deutschland, uh, Islamic Society of Germany, now called Muslims of, of Germany, Muslim Association of Britain, and so on and so forth. These groups that, of course, vehemently deny uh, any connection uh, to the Brotherhood, if not at times in historical terms. Uh, and to some degree, they are correct. They're not publicly the Muslim Brotherhood. But of course, the organization is set up and largely controlled by individuals who belong to the non-public side of the Muslim Brotherhood. And then we have a third level of analysis. So if we have the, uh, the secret part, the public part, then we have organizations that, while not directly 
uh, controlled by the Brotherhood in, in different European countries have solid historical, organizational, financial, and of course, ideological links to the first two categories. Uh, the Brotherhood is very good at utilizing other entities uh, um, to pursue its goals. As I said earlier, we're talking about an organization of very small numbers, few individuals, but with a keen ability to project a much larger presence thanks to his ability to exploit alliances, to partner uh, with all kinds of entities, sort of a parasitic tendency, which is quite, uh, quite developed. Uh, what are the goals? What are the aims of, uh, of this milieu in each country? Uh, well, of course, there's a, there's a commonality with, again, uh, with the Arab world, with the Middle East. Uh, it's seeing Islam as a comprehensive, all-encompassing system, regulating all aspects of private and public life. But the Brotherhood is a very pragmatic, very flexible movement that understands exactly the environment in which it operates and understands specifically that applying the goals of uh, Muslim majority societies to Europe or to the West makes little sense. Uh, so the goals are not turning Germany, turning Switzerland, turning Canada into an Islamic state. It might be a lofty aspiration centuries down the line, but it's obviously not what the Brotherhood works on on a daily basis. Uh, the goals are much more pragmatic, and I would say they're threefold. Uh, the first one is that of becoming the leaders of Muslim communities internally, meaning uh, influencing the political and religious identity of Muslim communities in all Western countries, uh, using their very sophisticated apparatus of mosques, organizations, uh, their platforms. Their, the idea is to interpret uh, it to create the de facto official interpretation of what it means to be Muslims in, uh, in Europe, in the West. Uh, the second goal is that of becoming the official or the de facto gatekeepers uh, of, uh, of the Muslim community in the eyes of European establishments, whether that's government or media, uh, civil society, and so on. The idea is, the goal is to be the go-to entities, the go-to people that European establishments reach out to whenever they need to talk to the Muslim community. It is to create this strong identity of uh, an image of a homogeneous Muslim community, which of course we all know it's not exactly uh, mirroring reality uh, and not of, of course respecting the enormous diversity that exists within Muslim communities. But the idea is that they will be the ones who manage all aspects of the Muslim community uh, from childbirth all the way to, um, to funeral parlors. And all this done with the support, if, uh, if, with the authorization, if not even the financial support that comes from governments. And finally, the third goal is that of influencing policy, acting as a lobbying group. Because of the uh, cozy relationship they want to develop with European establishments, they want to leverage those to influence anything that goes from the, Israeli, the uh, policies on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict all the way down to domestic issues. Uh, now, why is the Brotherhood so successful? And first of all, let me say that they're not as successful as we often make them out to be. There are a lot of limits uh, in their success and there's, um, uh, there's a lot of internal debate uh, within Brotherhood networks as to whether they are successful or not. But indeed they have uh, a method of mobilization and activism that uh, uh, has given them quite a few successes in, in most European countries. Uh, and of course, it's their ability to participate in um, all kinds of political uh, activism, ranging from street protests uh, to all the way to providing briefings to, to prime ministers and so on and so forth. So there's the idea, people, some people call it the entrism, uh, the ability to influence all kind of political activities. And of course, doing so by tailoring their language and their methodology. Uh, what I always amazed is also their ability to uh, be very extremely flexible about their, their alliances. Uh, it doesn't shock, shouldn't shock anybody to see brotherhood groups uh, partnering with an LBGTQ uh, entity in the morning and then hosting an extremely homophobic Salafi imam at a mosque in the afternoon. Uh, 
uh, both alliances are tactical, serve a specific goal for the Brotherhood. The only challenge for them is how to balance the two. Uh, but it's very common for, for Brotherhood to try to create this kind of, uh, this kind of alliances. Uh, beyond this keen mobilization skills and activism skills, uh, the secret for their success is, of course, uh, funding. It's money. Uh, the Brotherhood has been able to operate uh, on such a large scale in Europe, despite their small numbers, because of the ample resources they have historically been able to uh, to mobilize and so where does the money come from now of course that's uh, it's a complicated issue uh, with a lot of gray areas historically uh, it's mostly foreign funding uh, arab gulf countries most of them today then basically boils down to qatar and of course with the addition of the last decade of of turkey um, so foreign funding remains arguably one of the main uh, sources of, of funding. But some of it is self-generated. Uh, Brotherhood activists are very good entrepreneurs. Some have their own private activities. They also have the ability to collect charity uh, within the community. Uh, so there's some of the funding comes internally. And I think what is, the, uh, what is also extremely interesting, and I think arguably of, of concern, is that uh, part of the funding for Brotherhood organizations come from, comes from Western governments, uh, from individual European governments, from the European Union, which subsidize some of these entities, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, for a variety of activities that range from uh, integrating refugees to preventing radicalization, uh, to fighting Islamophobia and racism. But several brotherhood milieus in European countries have created spin-offs uh, uh, whose, whose connections to the brotherhood are at times difficult to prove or lost uh, in, uh, uh, for, for those that give out public funding. Uh, now, the perennial debate, and I'm, I'm aware of it, I might be uh, exceeding my allotted time. Uh, what do Europeans think about the Brotherhood? What is the debate going? I said, of course, there's been quite a bit of a change. Uh, there's hardly a homogeneous assessment. First of all, on what is the Brotherhood in the West? I think we're still very much seeing debates on whether organization A or individual B are Brotherhood. What does it mean to be Brotherhood? The identification of an entity as brotherhood uh, is something extremely complex, uh, which leads to, of course, a knee-jerk reaction from brotherhood networks and uh, uh, their sort of fellow travelers of Islamophobia, racism, and so on and so forth. Uh, the debate often uh, swerves in a direction that is not really empirically based and purely based on uh, uh, Twitter-like arguments. So uh, on this, I have to uh, give kudos to um, to the authors of the reports because they've been very serious in crafting a methodology for what it means to be brotherhood that doesn't that sort of try to strike a, a balance between the everybody's brotherhood to nobody's brotherhood and i think it's something very difficult and of course it's an assessment that needs to be made on a case-by-case -case basis with a sound uh, methodology let's even assume we can find a, a common framework to identify what is a brotherhood entity then we reach the second step, which is, what does that mean? Uh, are brotherhood entities problematic or not? Uh, from what lenses do we judge that? Uh, from a terrorism point of view, and again, the, the never-ending debate, is the brotherhood part of the problem or part of the solution when it comes to, to terrorism? I'm uh, one of the believers that is part of the problem because it does provide a narrative that is conducive uh, to further radicalization, uh, but undeniably it is not engaged directly in terrorist activities in the West. But at the same time, it is, uh, it has historically and still now funded terrorist activities outside of Europe. Think of Hamas, think of a variety of jihadist militia in countries like Libya and Syria over the last few years. So the connections to terrorism are ample. Uh, if you then move the conversation to uh, as I said, most European countries are doing on uh, integration, social cohesion. We do see that, again, it's a never ending debate um, about the impact on bro of brotherhood activity, uh, brotherhood uh, milieus on social cohesion. Now, they publicly declare their allegiance to democracy, their desire to uh, favor the integration of Muslim communities. 
I think there's ample evidence also of the contrary because of some of the narrative that they espouse, some of their, their us and them, if not us versus them narrative and their politically cynical abuse of, uh, of the Islamophobia card and their very problematic views on issues such as um, gay rights, women rights, religious freedom. All these elements, I think, uh, lead many to argue that uh, the impact on social cohesion over the Brotherhood is very negative. Let me conclude uh, with uh, some quotes that I think I'm not going to read all this. I'm going to spare you from, from all this. But what I find interesting is to see where, in, uh, where the security services in a variety of European countries are going in their thinking on the Brotherhood. As I said, there's been quite a uh, quite a shift and quite an intensification of, uh, of the debate on the Brotherhood. And it's very interesting to see uh, that while it is true that at a political level there's not a consensus, uh, the security services in arguably all Europe continental European countries are very negative on, on the Brotherhood. And whether you look at the AVD in the Netherlands, uh, the Bundesverfassungsschutz in, uh, in Austria, or um, the Bundesverfassungsschutz in, in Germany, you do see these concerns about the Brotherhood, both from a league, from a, um, a radicalization and a social cohesion point of view. Let me just read this quote, and then I'm going to close my remarks here. It says, these legalistic Islamist groups, and by legalistic, the Germans mean that these are the groups, Brotherhood and similar groups, that operate within the law. So they're not designated as terrorist organization, but they're monitored by the Germans. This legalistic Islamist group represent an especial threat to the internal cohesion of our society. Among other things, their wide range of Islamist-oriented educational and support activities are used to promote the creation of proliferation of an Islamist milieu in Germany. These endeavor endeavors run counter to the efforts undertaken by the federal administration and the lender to integrate immigrants. Final thing about radicalization, there is the risk that such milieus could also form the breeding ground for further radicalization. So, I try to provide uh, a bit of a, of a framework in general. I know that a lot of the um, topics that the authors discussed in their reports touch on this, but of course they're applied to the Eastern European context, which have, has, of course, its, its peculiarities. Uh, I'll leave it at that. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And I look forward to uh, everybody's 